This episode is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Whether you love true crime or comedy, celebrity interviews or news, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue. And guess what? Now you can call them on your auto insurance too with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. It works just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance and they'll show you coverage options that fit your budget. Get your quote today at Progressive.com to join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. Hello, friends. Lee C. Camp here. You're listening to No Small Endeavor. This is our unabridged interview with Dacker Keltner. Dacker is a psychologist at UC Berkeley, author of the recent best-selling book, Awe. That's A-W-E. One of my favorite things to do in some of my teaching is to look at areas of cross-disciplinary interest and concern and research. This is a classic case of that, obviously, in theological traditions. The study and thinking about reflection upon awe, the human necessity of awe, is a central theme. And here you have with Dacker, a psychologist, bringing scientific research to bear upon the same question, the practice of awe. And not only is it just a fascinating conversation, it's also highly practical, as you'll get, especially near the end of the conversation. Enjoy this, Dacker Keltner. Dacker Keltner is a professor of psychology at the University of California, Berkeley, the faculty director of UC Berkeley's Greater Good Science Center. He's a renowned expert in the science of human emotion and studies compassion and awe, how we express emotion and how emotions guide our moral identities and search for meaning. His research interests also expand issues of power, status, inequality, and social class. He's the author of The Power Paradox and the best-selling book Born to be Good and the co-editor of The Compassionate Instinct. His latest book, which we're discussing today, All, is a national bestseller. Welcome, Dacker. It's good to be with you, Lee. It's great to be with you. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a long while and grateful for you taking, taking time to be with us. So you you say in the introduction to all that you've taught happiness to hundreds of thousands of people, and yet at the same time you you uh, acknowledge that you've been pretty anxious for much of your life. Talk talk to us about that. (laughs) You get right to it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, you know, there are so many ironies in our careers, and one of them is that, um, you know, I teach happiness online to tens of thousands of people teach it at Berkeley, teach it in various contexts. And um, people think it's easy for me, but it's actually very hard. Um, And that's because, uh, you know, uh, genetically, there's enormous amounts of anxiety running through my mom's side of her family. Um, It hit me at different stages of development when I was 13. And uh, and then when I was 30 and moved from my first job and had more panic, panic attacks than you know, a sample of 100 Americans. And, and so, yeah, it's this, you know, it, it makes it all the more gratifying and um, a form of inquiry to teach happiness because sometimes mm-hmm. what I teach feels like a mystery to me, you know, personally. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so it touches yeah. me. And I feel its effects too, to really go into yeah. the deep inquiry of, of what it means to have a meaningful life. Yeah. I relate to that very much. I mean, I, yeah, I've been teaching, as I think I've told you, I've been teaching a class for undergrads called Joy in the Good Life that yeah. started out of a consultation at Yale with Miroslav Wolf a number of years ago. And, um, but part of that for me has been precisely kind of the same reason of, um, you know, I remember I got treated for, for my first uh, treatment was for anxiety was uh, an, an ulcer when I was like in seventh grade. And so, I, you know, I'm, I'm wired very seriously for the anxiety. And I tell my students, yeah. I've been wired for anxiety and yeah. similarly for me on my mother's side. Um, and that it's not easy for me either. And, yeah. um, but it's fascinating that of so much research that's being done and the kind of work that you're doing and others that are doing in, in the social sciences and the sciences, hard sciences is just so fascinating. So anyway, thank you for that. And thank for your yeah. willingness to kind of be open about the, the relevance of that to you. Yeah. Um, so you, you say I've taught people about finding the good life and we'll talk about all then for much yeah. of our time together, but I'm wondering if you could talk more about what has been central to you in your teaching yeah. on helping people find what you're calling a good life. Yeah. Well, I'm teaching it right now. You know, I look at the, um, field of well-being, and, and there are different theoretical frameworks, Carol Riffs, Martin Seligman's, you know, that drill it down to five to seven 
kind of core themes to find happiness and meaning and good health. And for me, um, I really reduce it to a few things. One is um, what you what 18th century philosophers call the moral sentiments, our virtues, our few, you know, our intuitions. Um, just these deep intuitions that so many contemplative traditions like Taoism, Buddhism, uh, r- Romanticism taught us to go in search of, you know, compassion, awe, gratitude, a feeling of common humanity and empathy, love, um, uh, you know, a sense of wonder. And so that's the first part of, of how I approach it is to get people to really trust their bodies, their feelings, mm. these ancient crafted by evolution intuitions about how it can be a good human being. The second is sociality is just, you know, um, cultivate an ethics of connection and, and, and a sense of, uh, you know, um, cooperation with people, of, of friendship, of common cause. Um, you know, 40% of Americans feel lonely right now. They don't have enough connection. And so there are actionable ways to do that. And then the third is how do you handle stress? You know, how mm-hmm. do you, you know, practice meditation techniques and tell stories and look at visual art and music in ways that, like you and I, feeling a lot of stress early in life, um, how can we make sense of it? How can we grow out of it? How can we yeah. take the hardships and turn them into wisdom? And so, you know, it's, and it's really dynamic. It's, uh, it does all the approaches don't work for everybody. You got to find your, your particular menu in a way to go after meaning. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the things I've found so interesting in a lot of the, the scientific studies around this is that, um, the multifaceted nature and it's kind of like what you all keep doing for us is giving us a sort of tool and I'll describe this way to my students you you get this kind of rich toolkit and you get to explore and see what which of these works best for you and it'll work differently for different people and so, yeah such an important lesson too right you know yeah. just to find you may be a body person and love yoga you may be a sacred text person and love big ideas you know and yeah and that's yeah. the challenge You've also done, as I understand it, a lot of study about shame and embarrassment. Yeah. Um, t- talk yeah. to us about how that fits into your larger project. Yeah, you know, th- this all began in some sense, you know, uh, I studied a lot of negative emotions like anger and fear and shame and embarrassment from the perspective that these emotions are what um, fold us into healthy relationships and, and community. You know, so you take an emotion like embarrassment, it feels painful in the moment, but what it functions as, and this traces back in our, our primate evolution, which I always look at things from an evolutionary perspective, mm-hmm. what it does is it, it, it's a way of acknowledging you've made a mistake, you're, you're apologizing for it, other people forgive you. So it serves this vital function of bringing us back into the fold when we've violated social conventions. Shame is deeper and, and gets more problematic. You know, it's about uh, moments, times of life when we don't live up to the, the the ideals and the aspirations we hold dear, right? And you're like, this is the kind of person I want to be, and look what I've done, and I feel ashamed. Uh, and in in the right context with the right people around you, you can move out of it and, and grow and learn, right? But unfortunately, shame very quickly is used against people and built into social structures, you know, like racism. Yeah. And so, um, so it, these emotions, all of them, and Aristotle wrote about this in the right way and in the right place to the right end, they, they keep us part of healthy communities, right? Uh, romantic partnerships, friendships, groups. And there, there are a lot of new data just showing like if we can kind of master and navigate with all of these emotions uh, in the right way, like Aristotle said, we'll, we'll be okay. You know, yeah. we'll, we'll find what we care about. Yeah, you, this was kind of implicit in what you said, but uh, I would like to hear you kind of comment on this quickly. Um, yeah, that there's there seems to be, I, I, and I think that maybe the first person I heard use this phrase was um, Anna Lemke, uh-huh. but uses the phrase pro-social shame and yeah. it, it, pointing to the fact that there's also a sort of toxic shame or a, yeah. a, a non-social shame. No, but right. kind of, how would you see the the difference between shame that is serving a yeah. fruitful, constructive end and that which doesn't? Yeah, what a, man, what a deep question. You know, I did a lot of work in um, forgiveness and restorative justice in prisons and, um, and 
elsewhere. And there you create a social context, drawing upon our very deep capacity to forgive, uh, drawing upon mammalian tendencies to reconcile in the face mm. of conflict and harm, mm. wherein, you know, this expression of shame uh, triggers in others the sense that you are apologizing, you, reg- you are filled with regret, and it brings about a reconciliation. And, mm. and that takes a lot of work, right? You have to have open dialogue and true apologies. And um, the person who you're directing shame towards sort of being open to change. And that's the, the upside to shame when it leads to pro-social ends. Uh, both people feel better. But obviously, bullies shame others uh, chronically, and it becomes toxic. So you can think about the, how chronic the shame is as an indicator of toxicity. Um, you could think about, you know, abuse of power dynamics uh, at work, for example, where somebody chronically feels ashamed. And then, you know, you look at the kind of the ossified, you know, social structures that produce shame, gender, um, race, where class, you know, the, the, the shame uh, in a culture like the U.S. where the poor are often um, denigrated. Uh, and there you've got toxic shame. And we, we're, we've learned a lot about how problematic it is for people's mm-hmm. well-being. Yeah. Um, mapping emotions with science. I, you you say yeah. that this is a, kind of a kind of cutting edge, I suppose, in many ways. That yeah. this has been something that's only been done what in the last couple of decades that this has begun. Yeah, you know the by mapping, you know it was. Uh, I, I love this quote from Virginia Woolf, like you know the the drivers of London have their maps, but we don't have a map of the heart or the passions. Mm. Um, and in some sense, the field of emotion that we've been talking about was dominated by a very narrow framework of Paul Ekman, who's well known and did the facial expression research and really got us to think about anger and fear and sadness and um, surprise and, and disgust and, and then joy. Um, and then we started to think about shame as a field in the 80s and 90s. But we know there's so much more to our subjective lives than that, right? And and the narrow, antiquated approach that that uh, led to was just thinking about just those six emotions um, and thinking that that's what constituted our emotional life. And I had the privilege of working with a young guy named Alan Cowan who had new statistical approaches, new methods. Mm. And Hmm. we went out and we just had people listen to 2,000 pieces of music or watch... 2,000 short gifts or, you know, and on and on. And and with new approaches, we came up with a ret- much richer map of emotion. And our huh. listeners should go to alancowan.com and check it out because, you know, 27 kinds of experience like admiration and awe and adoration and amusement and absorption are all really close to each other, yeah. but distinct, right? You can pull them huh. apart. Fear, terror, horror, which you ordinarily would just gloss over with one term, are actually really distinct subjective states. Huh. And so I think his work, it's only been published in the last few years, is really moving the field into a much richer view of, of our interior life. Yeah. And then um, you know that those are distinct subjective experiences or realities. Uh, right. And does this, does this also show as distinct in a sort of uh, neuroscience perspective as well? Yeah, you know, so, you know, our discoveries of how many emotions we can communicate with a voice, which is about 25, you know, I can go, huh, oh, you know, mm, huh. Um, really advanced with this new understanding of the richness of emotion. And then, you know, we have worked with a Japanese team and other people are doing this. Once you have this richer way to elicit emotion and have people report on it instead of just six emotions, maybe 30, right? Uh, yeah, the, the patterning of uh, emotions in the brain reveals there are 30 distinct patterns and there'll probably be more for huh. all these, you know, states like interest and beauty and love and, um, and calm and contentment and mystery, right? The, the, they all have these distinct por- profiles. And it's just a kind of a, a next chapter in, in how we'll understand the brain and emotion. Yeah. 
So just, just, just this very brief question, but just so that I can kind of get some clarity here. So yeah, is the, is the way the methodology works is that you're, um, <laughs> you're asking people to report on their experience and you're finding a, a word that people will use to map on to that kind of experience. And you find consistency on these subjective reports. And then you're correlating when people are in that state with what you see happening uh, in, the neuro- in, in the brain? Yeah, the, it, it's important to get to the methods. You know, a typical study in the past of emotion in the brain might have you think about a time you were angry or sad uh, or disgusted or show you slides that make you feel those emotions. And then you look for the patterning in different regions of the brain. And this new approach that's much more rich, what we call high dimensional approach, has an individual spend a long time in the scanner, look at 2,000 videos, right, that, mm. il- that we have found elicit 27 distinct states. And then in the scanner, they report on how they feel. Uh, and you map that to, with much more fine grained measurement tools, what are the patterns of activation in the brain? And there we see 28, 30 distinct emotion specific patterns, right? Yeah. And, and it starts to tell us that, yeah, I might differentiate love from admiration subjectively and conceptually in how I look at the world. And that registers in distinct patterns in the brain too, which, which probably should make sense. Yeah, that's fascinating. So now you say in this most recent book that um, you've turned more recently to the study of awe. So give us kind of a big picture of some of the main things that you've learned in the study of awe. Oh, it's been astonishing. You know, I, um, I, as I, you know, did my scientific career, I kept thinking like, God, we haven't studied why people, you know, are moved to tears by music that well, or spirituality, or the extraordinary changes that I've experienced backpacking with my daughter, right, in in nature. And all of those experiences felt like awe to me. And so about 10, 15 years ago, 15 years ago, my lab, you know, big lab of 10 grad students and postdocs working away, we got some nice grants. And I just said, let's go study awe, you know, Mm -hmm. Um, whatever way you can, out in nature, in the lab, with physiology, you know, with veterans rafting, whatever you, whatever inspires you, go find it, listening to music. And, and I think there are a few real highlights. Uh, awe is the feeling we have when we encounter vast, mysterious things, you know, for the most part. Um, first thing is we feel awe in response to um, what I call the eight wonders of life, which is the moral beauty of people, nature, collective moving in unison or effervescence, art, music, spiritual contemplation, and then big ideas, right? Like, God, you know, quantum physics. Mm. Uh, And then really interestingly, life and death, you know, the cycle of life. So we have eight wonders that lead us to feel awe. We can measure awe. You know, a lot of people didn't think you could measure it. It's, you know, goosebumps and tears and warmth in your chest and you know, the sense of being humble and small. Well, these are all very, you know, vocalizations around the world. Yeah. Whoa, huh. you know. Um, so we, we huh. can measure it. It's not beyond science. Third thing is what I called everyday awe in the book, Lee. You know, it really caught me off guard that we would study people every day and see if they'd had an experience of awe in different parts of the world. And people are feeling awe two to three times a week on average. Huh. You know, it's around us. And then, you know, why I really, really wrote the book is um, it's so good for you. You know, it is these brief doses of awe help your heart, your immune system. You know, they help your stress. Um, they help your reasoning. You become a sharper reasoner. They, they help you with your relationships, experiences of awe. And so, you know, the part of the spirit of the book is like, let's look at this mysterious emotion together, but let's, let's put more of it into our life. Huh. That's fascinating. Yeah, so I want to dig into a lot of those kind of things. Um, yeah. Let's dig in just briefly to the very last one you did and, and expound just a bit more on kind of the health and well-being yeah. manifestation or aspects, fruit of experiencing awe. What are, what are more details about things that you have observed in that regard? Oh, my God. And, and this is, you know, um, I'll, I'll start with 
two findings recently from our lab. You know, we took veterans out rafting, awesome trip for a day, half a day. Um, and what we find is a week later, because of all, you know, through this rafting, they have a 32% drop in PTSD, hmm. um, which is a very hard condition. Uh, just recently, we published a paper where, you know, medical doctors, nurses, uh, during the peak pandemic, um, you know, chaos in the hospitals, 30% understaffed, a million people dying without their families. You know, I did a lot of work with healthcare providers and it was, it was like combat. And we just had them find a moment of awe each day, you know, just like pause, open your mind to something big that you're part of, just reflect on it, breathe. And they had reductions in depression and anxiety and loneliness over 30 days, mm. right? So that tells us just a minute or two of this is good for us. Um, in the body, we know awe activates the vagus nerve, which is this large bundle of nerves in your body, slows your heart, helps you vocalize, helps you orient to people, helps you connect, right? Mm. Awe activates mm. that. Awe reduces inflammation, you know, this this uh, work that your immune system does, it heats up your body to kill pathogens. If you're chronically inflamed, it is so hard on your body, right? And awe cools down the inflammation response huh. at a chronic level. So that just tells us, man, it's good for your body. And then, you know, I think the big story psychologically is the, you know, there's Gene Twenge and others have made the case that all of this self-focus of our era, you know, of ruminating about the self, taking photos of the self, comparing me to other people online, you know, uh, that really plagues our young people today. Awe takes us out of the self, you know, mm. it quiets down the self, even at the neurological level. And it, it prompts you to think like, what am I part of that's, that's bigger than me? You know, that spiritual systems have done a good job of getting us to think about, but awe does this as well. Like, wow, I'm, I, I'm moved by this music. Why? Like what themes yeah. of life d does this speak to me about? And awe does that work for us in the moment. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, j I mean, just this morning, I, I was up early enough to see the, I was up before the sunrise and I sat with my cup of coffee on the front oh. porch w waiting to see the sunrise come up. Mm. And um, it was a spectacular morning with a lot of uh, rippled red in the in the cloud cover just mm. over the horizon there. And then what happened in in taking a moment to do that and and pouring myself a cup, a cup of coffee out of the French press that I had on the front porch, you know, was I, I kind of naturally went to the question of am I, am I living into what I have said is the big purpose of my life and, and, and trying to make a contribution to the larger world and be a part of the larger world. And it's, it was fast it's to, to hear yeah. you describe that and say, that was exactly my experience this morning of a sense of awe and a woe, and then asking questions that are bigger than myself and rather than being so focused on myself and release mm. and the release of anxiety, right. That yeah. comes with that sort yeah. of larger sense of the world. And what is that bigger purpose that you were reflecting upon? Um, it's, it's a, uh, I, I, I kind of have a seven point thing that I kind of regularly go back <laughs> and review about what I'm uh -huh. trying to do with my life. And so I actually just oh. pulled it back up and thought, okay, how, how, how well am I doing with this wow. kind of way I'm trying to, to live in the world? So, wow. Anyway, but it's, wow. you know, that's, that's so... a beautiful, beautiful description that you give there. So let me ask about this and you, you talk yeah. about these, um, I think it was eight ways that people experience yeah. all. Um, I was I was especially moved by your description of the way in which our observation of moral beauty can yeah. move us towards all that seeing other people's courage, kindness, strength, or their overcoming can move mm. us towards that. Mm. Mm. Um, so, what are what are ways that you you have seen that e either personally or what are ways that you saw that in your have seen that in your research? Oh my goodness, you know. Um, you know, the finding on moral beauty caught us off guard in the lab. You know, we studied 26 countries. We asked people to write stories of awe, you know, just what, just their own experience, not a scientist mm. telling them what to say, but their own experience in countries from Mexico to India. And, you know, I was expecting nature and spirituality and in came the findings that what we called moral beauty, you know, that 
other people's everyday people, you know, their, how they give, how they sacrifice, how they stand up to abuses of power, how they risk their lives courageously, how they overcome obstacles. Um, I remember this incredible story of a son um, writing about his dad and his dad grew up in poverty. Um, parents died young. He married this wonderful woman. She, they had a bunch of kids. She died young. Mm. You know, he worked until he was 90 just to get all the kids yeah. to a, a, a stable life. And the son was at his birthday party for the dad and he just was blown away by his dad's sacrifice, you know? Mm. And, um, yeah, I, um, we, we know that it's one of the deepest ways in which we can find the meaningful life is to surround ourselves with other people's moral beauty, to read about it, read about Gandhi, to look for it in the streets and you see how kind young kids are, to think about your mentors in life, you know, uh, maybe, or even a spiritual figure. What that does is it, it follows us, it leads us through this pattern of awe of like, man, look how, look like you just experienced, you know, Lee, like this is what I really care about, th this idea of justice. And it moves my body, it moves my mind to think about ways to emulate uh, the noble acts, of, the virtuous acts I've seen. Um, and, you know, once that finding started to come in, I, I started to think, and I hope our audience is about, where do I find my experiences of moral beauty? And for me, in part, it was this work I did in prisons, you know, through restorative yeah. justice. And man, you watch, you know, I would go to, I'd be inside the prison and with 180 prisoners, just me and a handful of volunteers, we're there all day. These are guys who've had the hardest lives, you know, many of them have killed people. Um, and watching them try to seek forgiveness and redemption and, and better their lives and the humanity of it all. Mm -hmm. Every, every time I was in there, I was just filled with tears and goosebumps. And I was like, why is that? What is this? You know, and it was moral beauty, just the, the urge for these prisoners to overcome their past and seek forgiveness. Um, so that's one example. And, and suddenly, you know, it's a great exercise to think about where else have I found this? How have I found this in literature? You know, when I yeah. first read the brothers Karamazov and, and I encountered <laughs> Alyosha Karamazov, you know, kind of a Christ-like figure, I was like, this guy is like, I, it was one of my first encounter with a, a saint in a way. Um, so, you know, it's a, a great exercise for us all personally to think about where do we get moved to tears by other people. Yeah. yeah. How about you? Yeah, you're, well, you're, well, you're mentioning of the, of, of the saints, you know, there's that old line, it's at least attributed to St. Francis, um, but it points to your point here where he said, you know, again, it's attributed to him, but the, the line, uh, preach the gospel at all times and if necessary, use words. Um, <laughs> and so it's that sort of, you're pointing us to kind of the moral exemplar yeah. as, yeah. as kind of perhaps being more significant in moral formation than texts, which of course, those of us in academics, we we love we our love. texts and for and for good reason we love our texts, right? But yeah. But there's there's this sort of sense of maybe that's not I hear you saying maybe that's not the primary way that most people get formed, their moral compass gets formed. I I I you know that I it's such a bold hypothesis Lee, but I and I think that, you know, I wish we had empirical data on it, but this new movement of moral exemplarism, like you're saying, that the, the real way in which we define our, um, our signature moral concerns and how we discover our signature virtues, maybe through just being with other people, you know. Um, yeah. It was interesting to me as I was reflecting writing this book, like, um, God, why do I love working with people impacted by the justice system, you know, and, and former prisoners? And then I was like, oh, yeah, I remember my mom coming back when I was a kid. And she had taught English writing in a, a Folsom prison close by. And she mm -hmm. showed me this photo of the faces of the, the guy she taught. And I was just like, that was as vivid as any, you know, key passage yeah. in Lao Tzu or Buddhism. So I do think there's something, I think it's worth thinking about very broadly. Like yeah. maybe that's the key to kind of guiding us morally is to yeah. be around people of beauty. This, um, in this, I think it's in this a similar section where you talk about 
everyday reverence. And yeah. you have this line yeah. where you say, subtle is everyday reference. Let me just read this passage because I think it's I think it's I think it's beautiful and very helpful. You say subtle is everyday reverence. How we shift our speech with compliments, solicitous mm. questions, and indirectness to show respect for others. Yeah. We momentarily shrink the size of our bodies in a subtle head bow or slouch to the shoulders to convey reverential deference. With a simple warm clasp of another person's arm, we can express gratitude and appreciation, activating oxytocin release in the vagus nerve in the recipient of our touch. So mm. I, I love that. So Thank tell you. us a little bit more about um, politeness, social kindness, respect, these kind yeah. of so-called soft skills and how that works into your research. Thank you. Thank you, Lee. Thanks for noticing that, you know, I uh, have devoted a lot of time to thinking about that and it, it doesn't, you know, it's just because it's so subtle and nonverbal and hard to describe, it doesn't have the kind of the, the cult, the reach in my field as, you know, practicing gratitude by writing your blessings or so forth. It yeah. feels like textual and, and strong. Yeah. You know, uh, it is a human universal. Um, in language and and then how we comport ourselves around other people by which we show deference and respect and reverence for other people, right? We show it in our tone of voice. We show it in linguistic constructions by which we acknowledge other people's perspectives and the, and the intelligence of their perspectives. We show it in what I've studied, grateful patterns of touch, just the, mm. the pat on the back, right? Um, we show it in our posture of, you know, all, it's so interesting when you look at, you know, images of the Buddha or other saints, you know, or saints, they, they often have a very modest demeanor, you know, humble demeanor, which recruits these same processes of like smallness, self-effacement, orienting towards other people, all of that from the spoken word to the touch, to the, the bodily expression of reverence, um, are foundational to to trusting relationships mm -hmm. um, and to, you know, and they're often, um, you know, critiqued, you know, oh, you don't want to be modest. You lose if you're modest. Uh, Self-effacement's bad. Who would care about humility? But thankfully, it's coming back, I think. Um, and, and it has such deep roots. And it's a way that you can always embody these ethical principles, right? Of like, I love the idea of respect. Well, what do I do when I go to work? Well, here are a set of things to be thinking about to mm. to orient with reverence. Yeah, thanks for th calling it out. It took me. Yeah, I, yeah. I thought about that no. for a long time, and yeah, and I'm glad yeah, it reached one you. person. <laughs> thank you for that very much. Um, you know, I think about the notion of humility and um, just, just kind of in the trajectory of my own life. I think that there was a, there was a mm. point at which the kind of call to humility that we got in in my childhood. Um, I don't know. I read. I can't. Who, who, I was reading uh, Philip Yancey's uh, memoir for an interview, mm -hmm. but uh, he he quotes someone who talks about how cruel it is to ask someone to sacrifice the self when there's not a selfhood developed yet. Yeah, and yeah. which I thought was very insightful. Um, but I think I think in my early childhood, when I'm trying to practice humility, I didn't have a really formed selfhood yet. Yeah. And so the kind of self-sacrifice or the humility couldn't right. be f really the the yeah. beauty that I think it is as a virtue. Um, and then, so then there's a, the kind of swing to developing selfhood when then one can begin to not practice humility, uh, and because of a focus upon development of the self and assertion of the self and which I think I increasingly think is a important part of human development. And, but then what I've discovered yeah, is agree. that humility then can become this sort of superpower where, yeah. Where I don't have to be so obsessed with myself, and it gives me a new kind of freedom, which fits in with all of this stuff that you're talking about. All right, that yeah. awe and humility are necessarily going to go together. It seems like yeah. to me, yeah. uh, and then it gives a, a, a liberty to be living a different kind of life that's not so burdened with worrying about the self. But any any further commentary on that? Yeah, well, we do find awe pr leads people to feel humble. You know, you take in a big view here in Berkeley, and which we did in one of our studies, and it's expansive, almost like the view you had. And people feel like, God, I feel humble. I feel really interested in other people and their virtues and strengths, which is part of humility, not so obsessed with my own rank and status. Um, and then the you raise this fascinating point that is very would be very hard to study scientifically, but important, which is that 
you know, we have to watch out that you, if you lose a sense of self with, through awe, without a developed sense of self, you can get into trouble, right? Mm. So you might imagine adolescence, you know, taking too many drugs or being around a cult figure or becoming obsessed with Justin Bieber, whatever it is, <laughs> without that core self, they can get lost, right? They can, uh, the loss of self beca can become dangerous. And so um, we have found uh, that indeed, you know, you, with a little bit of evidence that that loss of self through all the humility that comes does indeed need a certain sense of coherence to your identity to really mm -hmm. do its good work. Uh, and it points to risks of awe, which we should always be thinking about mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. You, uh, you also talk about, you alluded to this, I think briefly, um, that collective effervescence is another kind of place that people experience all. So yeah. first define that. And I guess that yeah. comes from Durkheim, right? Yeah. But define that for folks who are unfamiliar with it and then what you've, what you've learned about that. Yeah. Thank you. It's, it's one of my favorites, you know, collective effervescence is a, you know, Emile Durkheim is this French sociologist who is studying religion in different parts of the world. And he really felt that the core was feeling, uh, much like Emerson and William James did that this was the core. And in particular, um, the, the feeling that arises when you start moving in unison with other people, you start making sounds in unison with other people, you start uh, sharing attention and awareness, you know, you're, you're sort of all looking at the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then certain kinds of symbolic thought and ideation emerge in collective effervescence. But the feeling of it is this electric bubbling feeling of like, wow, we're all together and yeah. we're, we're excited and, and awestruck. Um, and, and I think everybody's had experiences of, of that. And so what we were lucky to discover in our study of 26 countries, you know, as people wrote these stories of awe is collective effervescence has some classic forms, you know, uh, rituals and religious practice, singing together is, you mm -hmm. know, people started coming to me from choirs like, all we, we just start singing together and we were crying and it feels yeah. like a spiritual moment. Um, you may have had Lee, um, uh, dance, you know, there's a whole new science of dance of how, you know, just moving your mm -hmm. bodies together. Suddenly you feel this deeper sense of common humanity. Um, and, and then very interestingly sports, <laughs> you know, yeah. gathering for sports, cheering teams on playing them, getting lost in the moment. And, and it, I, you know, when you try in any way to get a group of say a hundred people to share awareness and get on the same page and feel together, it's hard. Yeah. Um, and here's, you know, sport and singing together and moving together through dance or whatever the case may be, does it really quickly yeah. and it's powerful. You know, it has this wonderful yeah. effect on us. Yeah. Yeah, it's. I, I think it's wonderful too. And as you were talking, I mean, you know, I'm flashing back because I come from a Christian tradition that yeah. uh, traditionally practiced a cappella singing. Oh, and so you're, you've got people practicing four part harmony singing. And so I remember as a child, you know, I'm five years old, yeah. of being taken up in a moment where you've got 150, 200 people who are, who are pretty decent at doing yeah. four part a cappella singing. And it's just amazing, you know, and it kind is. Of can catch one up in that. And then getting to do our live shows in Nashville, we, we have these incredible yeah, Nashville yeah. musicians and to watch the sort of effervescence that happens among yeah. them and then people watching them and listening to them. It's just it's oh, yeah. amazing. It's amazing. Yeah. Experience. And, you know, I was, I was just teaching this and, you know, a couple of observations, like to produce sound when you sing, you know, we know every sound, every, every human vocal apparatus produces a unique signature of sound. So it's your identity, huh. but then it goes out and merges with everybody else's identities. You know, it's almost like Hinduism and Atman and Brahman and the merging of my soul with collective soul. And then this, this mom talked about, you know, she's like, I'm embarrassed to say, but I had, my daughter had this extra ticket and I got to go see Taylor Swift. And it's, I mean, it's one of the great moments of collective effervescence where yeah. 50,000 people, 70,000 people are going, they get to sing a special song with Taylor Swift. They're all together. Yeah. They're sharing these bands. It's a transformative moment, you know, and, and, uh, in my view, a good thing to, right. To have this. Yeah. yeah that, well, that's the other place I flashed back to was, um, I grew up, uh, 
in Alabama, and my father was a graduate. Oh. My grandfather was a graduate of the University of Alabama. So when I was a kid, we would go to the Alabama games. At their, oh my at that God. time, they were still playing in Birmingham. Yeah. And you talk about collective effervescence, you know, and especially oh on a cookoff when you've got you know eighty thousand people shouting "Roll Tide, Roll" as during the kickoff. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. And then going to Notre Dame as a grad student. Yeah. And the sort of football experience, again, this collective effervescence is just. Yeah. This. And we shouldn't, you know, you know, we often sort of think they're lesser forms of, of transcendence. But I think the science of awe tells us like those are, you know, those collective effervescent experiences at sports date back to the ball court games and wow. Mayan traditions, the Olympics. I mean, this is a deep tendency that's worth worth bringing into our lives. Yeah. Another place you talk about people experiencing awe is in is in nature and yeah. music any quick commentaries yeah. on either one of the, either or both of those yeah you know I, I mean and these are the most intuitive in some sense for a lot of western europeans you know like um uh and you know all i mean all i'll say about nature the thing about nature is you know people are like yeah you know i wow the grand canyon or the rockies um the big stuff but it's also the everyday nature the gardening the watching flowers, the looking at clouds, pausing and slowing down. Yeah. And, and the, 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 I think there are a couple of things that are really remarkable from, from my perspective. Um, one is the power of nature. Mm -hmm. You know, Ming Kuo has a new review out, 21 pathways by which nature is good for your nervous system, for huh. your cells and your brain and your vagus nerve and your immune system. Hmm. So who is that again? Ming Kuo, K-U-O, I think 2015. So the power of nature really needs to be appreciated. And then the other thing, and you know, um, like Dr. Yuri Salidwin's been writing about this and are thinking about ecological belonging, that we are part of nature. Uh, in some sense, Emerson and his writings on, you know, on nature got to this as well, where he was saying, as does Dr. Yuri Salidwin, like, we are part of nature. Our, our minds are nature. And Emerson wrote a lot about like our best ideas come out of observing the being in the natural world, oh. ideas like impermanence and cycles, right? Mm. And that we're part of things. Um, so let's just remember how good it is for our minds and bodies. And I think that, you know, in writing awe, the big mystery to me that I, I think, I don't know if we'll ever figure out is music, you know, and and I think we may have to leave it to the philosophers in some sense, because music's pretty tough to study. But, you know, people can go, in, you know, and I write about this, like, when we find the right music for us, and I'm gonna ask you, Lee, like, give me an, well, give me an example of like a moment of transcendent awe in music for you. Um, oh, so many. Um, yeah. But I, I think to, um, I mean, I'm, I'm immediately flashing to a scene in a show we did last November in the Ryman Auditorium here in mm. downtown Nashville, where Brian Sutton, who's maybe one of the most celebrated uh, acoustic guitarists of mm. our generation, mm. um, and uh, Tammy Rogers, a uh, very well-respected fiddle player here in town, where he, he performs on uh, guitar uh, this fantastic classical piece that was written I'm, I'm going to have to put put it in the notes, the title of the song, because I'm drawing a blank at the moment. Yeah. Um, but um, it's a, it was a song written by the composer at the death, meditating the death of his brother. Ah, my and goodness. so Brian is playing this song and the fiddle player's coming in. It's just the two of them on stage. Yeah. And it was this sort of, you know, everybody's holding their breath. Wow. With them. And there's some, there's something about, I mean, how, how can, how can grief, be communicated through music that way, but it is. And it's yeah. just this incredible, you know, shared moment of beauty and and awe and mm. and grief in, mm. in that. I, and I don't know how I don't know how that works, but it does. It's just yeah. amazing. Thank you. Well, what a what a incredible example. And and that's exactly to me the mystery of music and awe and transcendence and, and the sublime is we know, like if I get with a big group of people, I see Taylor Swift, I'm rocking in unison, I start getting goosebumps, collective effervescence, sharing yeah. it. Um, but the, the deeper question in some sense is how music through sounds conveys these existential themes like loss, grief, love, war, 
triumph, power, right? Which it does. And Susan Langer, the great philosopher, wrote about that very convincingly. But it, to me, how that happens is, is almost beyond science and rational mm. description, right? That I, you know, I was grieving the loss of my brother. Um, and I went to interview this cellist, Yumi Kendall, and she was performing a John Adams piece, uh, who's a great American composer, kind of a modern co contemporary composer, uh, Sherazade 2.0. And, and I was listening to it and I was just deep in the loss of my younger brother, Rolf, and really not understanding it. And somehow toward the end of this um, symphony or whatever it was called, you know, the the violin was sort of this soft sound that was abating and there were these loud sounds coming out. And I started to understand that, you know, that the softer forms were, were sort of fading into non-existence. Like, well, that's kind of the life cycle too, that there's mm -hmm. this big process we're part of that um, um, quiets us. And, and I had this new insight into losing my brother. I, how that happens, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's astonishing that pa sound waves can yield some of the biggest insights about the meaning of yeah. life. It happens all the time. And yeah. your example, this, it's, it's one of the great mysteries of awe that remains is how that works. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for that, Dacker. Um, so we've got about 11 minutes left, but so let me ask a, a couple of questions, kind of sure. uh, three, or, three or four I got left. So we'll hit okay. them kind of briefly. Um, one, you you point to the way in which this your study of emotion that you wouldn't want us. I hear you saying you wouldn't want us to reduce this to a study of simply ephemeral passing states, but that yeah. this is significant because emotion is and or can be linked up with action and how yeah. we are in the world. So talk to us yeah. about that. Yeah, you know, John Paul Sartre wrote about, you know, in his a little book on emotions, he said they produce these magical transformations. And in some sense, and then William James, you know, that feeling, and more recently, Mark Solms, um, feeling is consciousness, you know, oh. it's our mind, it's who we think we are. And I think, I think those are right. And so that tells us like, and Aristotle wrote about this, like, we need to cultivate the right feelings, because um they they and we've done work on this they really guide how we look at the world in terms of its moral nature and its meaning and then they animate actions you know they they point us in directions if i feel compassion i am going to tend to need i will give things away and well documented and so awe is so i think it's urgently needed for this moment you know it gets us out of the self and it, it makes us see the systems around us that i'm part of which produces awe, and I, yeah. and then I can work on those systems. Oh my God, you know, look at the political system I'm part of, or, or this, you know, in your case, Lee, like this history of music that's a system, and what are you giving to it, right? Or the ecosystem around us. So it, it really, it re, it gets us to really notice the big, the like you said earlier, like this is what my life's about. This is the things mm -hmm. that it's part of, and then it 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 leads to. Wonderful actions, you know, for the most part of yeah. sharing and cooperation and collaboration. So uh, pretty, pretty good news for our yeah. times today. Yeah, that reminds me um, or prompts a question Yeah, uh, that I've seen kind of in uh, doing therapy work or talking to other people who are in therapy work or recovery that there's this sort of um, push against those who will say you ought not feel that way there's a sort of stigmatizing of feeling a certain way and i and i think that at one level that's a helpful pushback you know for us not to be so instructive about what other people are feeling but at the same time you're you're suggesting that it's crucial that we do take some responsibility for the kinds of feelings that we cultivate is that is that a helpful way to say that <laughs> you you're asking such nuanced complicated questions you know and it's one of the, um, I think it's the, in some sense, the central challenge of this view of, of happiness that we find it in feeling like gratitude and compassion, awe, joy, love, amusement, and so forth. Um, and and the, the challenge is this, which is these feelings are ancient, almost involuntary reactions, like, whoa, I felt awe, you know, yeah. uh, looking at the, the clouds or the act of generosity of these two five-year-olds showing. But so 
how do I, you know, if it's out of my control, how do I build it into a part of my life? And that's the challenge, you know? Yeah. And what I, with respect to awe, what I write about in the book is like, you know, basically like, hey, here's an awe mindset, you know, pause and think about big things, try to connect to vast things around you, uh, choose a wonder to immerse yourself in for five minutes a day, like music. So yeah, it's, it's just, <laughs> if it was, and I think, the the awe science and certain extensions of it, like conversions in, you know, the study of conversions in religion and and sci- the spirit medicine psychedelic literature gives you the feeling like you just need one and then life works out. And that's mm. not true. You know, you got to yeah. continually be practicing right. this. And and the science points the way. Huh. Fascinating. Um, so you say at one point near the near the end uh, yeah. of your book. Uh, there's a section in, entitled "The Big Idea of All." We yeah. are part of systems larger than the self, and um, I I think if there's there's one. So if you'll allow me just a a, a space of kind of a pushing just a little bit sure. on, on this, yeah. Um, so if if all as you say at one point, all is the feeling of being in the presence of something vast that transcends your current understanding of the world. But I wonder if if um, you don't um, respect your own definition here at the end by yeah. saying we are part that what all is is we are part of systems larger than the self in the sense that your your use of systems here seems to make all reducible to something presumably understandable. Yeah, yeah, and that's that, a good point. Um, and that when I think about Durkheim, for example, uh, with collective effervescence, I find that. And intensely, I mean, uh, very illuminating and very helpful. Yeah. And yet at the same time, it seems to want to reduce very much this so. experience of transcendence to something explainable. Yeah. And so I, I guess this is one reason that I, I, I like the, you know, the classic dogma of, of God yeah. in the sense that it cannot be reducible to something understandable. I so agree. I don't know. What, what are your, what are your th- thoughts on that? Well, I, I would, I would just, I would all push back a little, uh, yeah, not sure. push back, but um, I, I think you're, you're right. But, you know, when you really, and I'll, I'll use Darwin as an example where, you know, he discovered his view, the big epiphany for him was uh, evolution by natural selection, which is, uh, you know, you take humans, we are this, we're part of the system of this process of producing who we are. And systems are always changing. They're always evolving. They have dynamics that are unpredictable. They have fundamental mysteries. Uh, and he felt that about evolution. Yeah. Yumi Kendall you know, one of the great cellists of the United States, she's like, God, when I participate in music, a system of many, at many levels, I, you know, it's part of history of humans and it's what we do and, and it brings us these tears and it's always changing and I don't know where it'll go, but I do uh-huh. know I am part of it. My sounds from my cello are producing sounds that the audience appreciates that change lives. And, and, but there's a fundamental mystery always about about what the system will be tomorrow yeah. uh, and, and what form it'll take over time. And that's that I feel that capture. I, I share this with you, Lee, profoundly. In some sense, the energy of awe is mystery. It's just like, huh, yeah. wow, how could that be? I kind of understand it now. I update my knowledge. But there's still so much that remains to be yeah. explored. It's so funny that when, when I was reading the end of your book, and you start talking about Darwin, because so I'm having this inner dialogue that I just raised, you know, as I'm reading yeah. that last section of your book. And then you start talking about Darwin, and I think, well, but what about that passage at the end of Darwin, which yeah. you then go on to quote? So for, yeah. for for those who are listening, you know, there's this beautiful passage where he says, where Darwin says, I think it's maybe the very last paragraph of his of the uh, of is. his book. It says, "There is grandeur in this view of life, with its several powers, having been originally breathed by the Creator into a few forms or into one." And that whilst this planet has gone cycling on according to the fixed law of gravity, from so simple a beginning, endless forms most beautiful and most wonderful have been and are being evolved. So, mm. it, uh, yeah, it's, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful passage. It is. Um, any for it. closing uh, encouragement or exposition on a bit more on cultivating everyday forms of awe for us? Yeah, I'll just say a couple of things. First of all, what I love about awe, you know, is it puts, is this kind of conversation, Lee, you know, people, in, it's, it's, it's just so rich to, you know, people of different spiritual orientations and 
uh, and the and the like, really finding common language for yeah. the what's beyond human understanding and divine mystery in some mm. sense. Um, yeah, you know, I I I wrote this book when I was grieving the loss of my younger brother, which was a devastating experience. Um, I was knocked uh, off the rails. Um, and, and as I write in the book, I was like, God, I do this science of awe, I'm gonna go find it, you know, Hmm. and it changed my life. Um, it, and finding it is, you know, just, um, take a moment every day, slow it down, put away your usual labels and expectations and, and then observe and, and breathe and be open to big, vast things, you know, and you can do that. You know, I'm looking at a cactus right now and feeling it. You can look at the sky, mm. listen to music, look at somebody's eyes, you know, watch children play, mm. whatever it is. Um, just the awe mindsets about slowing down, quieting the voice of the self and opening up to think about those systems you're part of or how you, however you define it. Yeah. Um, and then the second thing is, you know, those eight wonders are, those are like, you know, um, those are great ways we can find it. Music, nature, spiritual practice, prayer, you know, big ideas, looking at visual things and, and just make it part of your day for a few minutes and, hmm. and it changed my life. Um, so I hope, I hope our listeners will take a look at it and, and uh, think about moments of awe for their lives. I've been talking to Dacker Keltner, professor at UC Berkeley, author most recently of the book, Awe, a national bestseller. Docker, thanks so much for your time. It's been rich and uh, really appreciate your generosity and uh, all that you've shared with us. Thanks so much. Thank you, Lee. It's been a, a wonderful conversation. If you've enjoyed our episode with some of the Hollywood stars like Rob Reiner, Martin Sheen, or Rain Wilson, then you should check out the new season of the wildly popular podcast Revisionist History. Hosted by No Small Endeavor friend and New York Times bestselling author Malcolm Gladwell, The new season of Revisionist History digs into stories that fell apart, like Hollywood projects that fell apart and why they did. Malcolm speaks with the minds behind some of Hollywood's biggest hits and asks them to pitch their favorite ideas, the ones that broke their heart because they never got made. It's a season all about a phrase that no one in Hollywood ever wants to hear, development hell. You can listen to those stories on Revisionist History wherever you get your podcasts. Our thanks to all the stellar team that makes this show possible. Christy Bragg, Jacob Lewis, Sophie Byard, Tom Anderson, Kate Hayes, Mary Evelyn Brown, Carriot Harmon, Jason Sheasley, Ellis Osborne, and Tim Lauer. And special thanks to Brian Sutton and Tammy Rogers featured in that gorgeous performance of Schumann's Nachstuka. And you'll forgive me, I trust. I do know my German's terrible. Thanks for listening, and let's keep exploring what it means to live a good life together. No Small Endeavor is a production of PRX, Tokens Media, LLC, and... Great Feeling Studios.